And uh, I want to take a moment to begin with a word of appreciation to the Reverend Dr. Brian Brown, who joined us last Sunday at 9.30 and 11 o'clock as we are talking about this topic of when Christians get it wrong. And in conjunction with uh, MLK Day and Ecumenical Week, uh, we had invited Woodlawn to come and be with us that day, but God is obviously going to be doing abundantly far more with that than we can ever ask or imagine is Pastor John and our choir head over to Woodlawn on February 6th at the 11 o'clock service. We were fortunate at the 11 o'clock service to have the Woodlawn choir with us. You may have watched that on YouTube. If you haven't had a chance to, you should at least look at a number or two. But I was really thrilled, Andreas, uh, when you had us up here clapping a little bit because at 11 o'clock last Sunday, we weren't just clapping, we were swaying here in the sanctuary. It's like we had a little life. And uh, it's like uh, Pastor Brian Brown talked about. Um, he had shared with us that in his mind, he thought the Spirit fell on black folk a certain way, and the Spirit fell on white folk a certain way. And when he went on his Emmaus walk, he realized that wasn't so. And uh, I think we experienced a little bit of that when we were together with Brian and Woodlawn Congregation. So a special word of thanks for that. Uh, I do want to uh, let you know that Brian shared 11 o'clock when he realized what time it was after the three special songs Woodlawn did, that he realized that the uh, Altersgate services actually didn't end at 12, but at 1.30. So I promise you we will be out of here before 11 o'clock. But when you're starting to talk about faith and politics and science, it's really hard to do a sermon in 20 minutes about those three topics and how they blend together. So if it's a little longer this morning, just bear with me. Hopefully we'll find all of this to be very informative and interesting as we continue on in this special sermon series that we're working on. Let's pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Our God, our Lord, our Redeemer, our friend. Amen and amen. So, Authors Gate family and friends, we have entered into this series of sermons about when Christians get it wrong, and we are wrestling with some issues that are controversial. Two of these issues where young adults who unfortunately seem to be staying away from the church in droves say we as Christians get it wrong include how we as Christians first view science and secondly politics. More specifically how we sometimes fear science and how we misuse politics. And of course as I already stated in 22 minutes we can't cover a lot of territory but we can think about a few things regarding these topics, okay? I don't know about you but I have heard it said, I know you have, that we should not mix religion and politics or religion and science. How many of you have ever heard that before? Almost everybody here, no matter where you are. Okay, but they get mixed all the time. I'm not sure why we think they shouldn't be able to be talked about together, except that maybe because people see things in different ways. And we think discussion of these topics will therefore lead to conflict, controversy, arguments, quarrels, and fights. And the truth is, it has and it does. Here's the perception from young adults. Christians and the church are primarily motivated by a political agenda and promote right-wing politics. So let's think this morning about how faith and science and politics can be talked about at the same time. And we all know in our current cultural context, we're dealing with the pandemic, we're dealing with the mask, and this is a very heated debate as it's going back and forth, and especially within school systems, right? We all know that this is part of it. I'm not here to solve that for anybody today. I'm here to think about how we think about it and talk about it and deal with it. One of the challenges we have today is that many people think that Christians are less intellectually active. The big divide in science, I think, came because of one big discovery that involved a man named Galileo and a tribunal of the Roman Catholic Church in June of 1633. 
Galileo was pronounced a heretic for promoting a scientific idea that contradicted the church's teaching. His idea was this, that the earth rotated around the sun and not the other way around. He created a primitive telescope and began to study the movement of stars and planets. And his discovery proved Copernicus right. At the time, the church believed the earth was stationary because they took literally the verse that says, the world is firmly established and it shall never be moved. So that made the earth the center of the universe. And Galileo's teaching was considered to be a heresy. And this was the verdict that was rendered by the court, the tribunal. Galileo, you have redeemed yourself in the judgment of this holy office, vehemently suspected of heresy, namely of having believed and held the doctrine which is false and contrary to sacred and divine scriptures, that the sun is the center of the world and does not move from east to west, and the earth does move and is not the center of the world. And that opinion may be held and defended as probable after it has been declared and defined as contrary to the Holy Scripture. So do you know what they made Galileo do? They made him take back what he said. He probably crossed his fingers when he did so because he wasn't going to let it go that easy, right? And then they placed him under house arrest for five years so that he would not spread any more of his ideas. Of course, today, this is just something we all take for granted, right? In fact, it's probably been some time since you thought about that story. But Galileo's discovery began a process where Christians complained that new scientific discoveries might undermine the faith. Topics such as the age of the earth to the much maligned science of evolution have some concern that the next scientific discovery may be the one that decisively shows that God does not exist or that the gospel might be untrue. Why do we sometimes think that the more we know about science, the less we'll believe in God? Do we fear science because we think it either competes with or destroys faith? Does science leave no room for God? Now, there are a couple things I'd like to offer you here. First off is what's called the flat earth theory. Sometimes Christians get the brunt of being idiots because we thought it seemed like at one time the earth was flat. Many think Columbus discovered it was round. He thought it was, but it was actually Magellan who sailed around the world. You can actually go back to the 6th century BC and discover no educated person believed the earth was flat, but it was actually more like a sphere, okay? Pythagoras, Aristotle, and by the 1st century AD, all Greeks and Romans accepted that the earth was round. Some folks in the late 1800s then used the flat earth theory against Christians in promoting the general lie that religion and faith are in nature, are a natural and eternal conflict in order to defend the concept of Darwinism. So a flat earth argument was used against creationists to say, look how stupid these Christians are. They're always getting in the way of science and progress. So what I'd like to do in the next couple moments is debunk that. There are many scientists today who do believe science and faith can stand together. For me personally, I am amazed when I look up into the sky at night and realize there's so much more out there that we don't even know anything about yet. And our creating God is still creating. If anything, science really magnifies God. Many scientists will say this has not happened by chance and that we are not just random beings. I believe that creation is the handiwork of God. God of wonders, we sang about this morning. If you travel at all, any place, you'll discover the earth is an amazing place. There's so much to see, so much to do, so much variety. 
And I think science helps us further see and discover and understand just how marvelous and exquisite creation really is. Psalm 19.1 says it like this, the heavens are telling the glory of God. And friends, it seems we are a small part of a universe being held in the hands of a loving, almighty God. The Reverend Dr. David Wilkinson, president, principal at St. John's College in English, has given us a caution. Some say science and religion explore the universe using two completely different methods, saying science is about fact and religion is about belief. As if Christians throw our brains away and just say we believe. He says in the end, he was drawn to God as someone with a scientific background, not because God could be proved to him, but that he could sit down, look at the evidence, evaluate it, and then make a judgment. He says, I was well into that as a scientist when I knew you had to assess evidence and you sometimes had evidence for, but then sometimes you had evidence against and that rarely had proof. And the evidence of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus drew me in, he says. However, the Christian faith is also about experience and scientists sometimes find it hard to characterize experience. Yet there were and still are some Christians who have problems with Darwinism. Many other Christians do not, but think of life as evolving anyway. Do I have a problem thinking that I might have come from a chimpanzee? Well, yeah, I do, but I also see how life forms evolve. And I see how we as humans have evolved in our learning in our being, in our doing, and in our understanding, and even our technology. I just think of growing up out on the farm there in the Shandell Valley and the variety of apples that I grew up picking. We had red and golden delicious. We had York and we had stamen and greenings and those were the basic varieties. And it was a big deal when we got our first gala apple trees to plant. And actually, they developed in New Zealand in the 1930s. And by the way, be on the lookout for the, one of the newest three apple varieties called the new Cosmic Crisp Apple, which I thought's really a cool name for our new apple based on what we're talking about today. The comic Cosmic Crisp is supposed to come out in February. Keep an eye out for it. It's actually coming from crops being produced in England right now. Therefore, many Christians decide to spend judgment and say, well, we're going to think about this and we're going to leave it open. What is God still doing? How is God using us to create? I think we as Christians get it right when we see science as an important companion in the quest for knowledge and truth. Science is not a threat to our faith, and neither is the Bible meant to be a scientific textbook. We need to think about that too. And on the matter of science, COVID, pandemic, and mask, we all do well to work together since right now no one is an expert on the matter as far as what I can tell. We're all trying to learn even if you think you might be an expert. It's like, okay, we keep thinking we're going to plan to be back together, right, J.D.? And then something comes up and we're not doing the things that we normally had been doing. So here's the thing. Science is not about trying to answer the questions of ultimate meaning. Science seeks to answer how the universe works. While faith focuses on teaching us what our existence means, we don't have to choose between one or the other. Both are valuable partners in understanding our place in the universe. For many people, the study of science serves to deepen their faith. We can know the creator through creation, and we are at our best when we realize we were created in the image of God and that we share with God in the divine care of this world world that we're in. The dominion we were given by God spoken of in Genesis reflects God's care for creation. And Christ who died and rose again becomes the healer of all creation because of the work on the cross and his resurrection. Now, I want to do something this morning um, that I'm, I've kind of added in here because this is really personal for me. Um, I want to share some thoughts from 
a guy by the name of Francis Collins who wrote a book called The Language of God. And uh, you might want to write that down. It might be a good book for you to read at some point in time. Uh, I know it was for me, The Language of God. And when did I read that book? I read that book when we lost our daughter Kelsey in the car accident in 2008, right afterwards. I had another friend, his name's Doug, who lost his son about 10 months later. And uh, we became friends, and we decided we wanted to read that book together. Why? Because we just had a lot of questions. Why God? Why this? Why that? We were just exploring matters of faith and God and life in general, because honestly, we, we, we were really just struggling in life at that point in time. And Co Collins, I found out, happened to be a scientist who works with genome theory, who happens to live in the Shenandoah Valley, who happens just to be a lay member, leader in his Presbyterian church. Here's what he says. Will we turn our backs on science because it is perceived as a threat to God, abandoning all of the promise of advancing our understanding of nature and applying that to the alleviation of suffering and the betterment of humankind? Alternatively, will we turn our backs on faith, concluding that science has rendered the spiritual life no longer necessary? and that traditional religious symbols can now be replaced by engravings of the double helix on our altars. Both of these choices are profoundly dangerous, he says, because both deny truth. Both will diminish the nobility of humankind, and both will be devastating to our future, and both are unnecessary. The God of the Bible is also the God of the genome. He can be worshipped in the cathedral or in the laboratory. His creation is majestic, awesome, intricate, and beautiful, and it cannot be at war with itself. Only we imperfect humans can start such battles, and only we can end them. And I don't know about you all, but that thought to me just sticks right here in my heart in a positive way. They can live together, science and our faith. Now, a few thoughts on when Christians get it wrong on politics. Here's what one young woman discovered. She said, I did not grow up in church. In fact, I did not go to church at all until I was 25 years old. I found myself supporting primarily Democrats running for the office because I believe they supported the issues that I deeply was concerned about, namely poverty, education, the environment, and health care. When I started attending church, it seemed many of my social concerns would have been the concerns of Jesus. I was therefore surprised at the reaction my political beliefs drew from some of the Christians I was meeting there. As a very new Christian, I thought I had done something wrong. I was given the impression that one could not be a Democrat and be a Christian at the same time. Now, the pastor who tells the story couldn't believe what happened to her. He noted how unwelcome she was meant to feel. He asked, what kind of church would do such a thing? Don't churches want people from outside the faith to join? Aren't committed and idealistic young folks like her precisely the sort of people churches should be reaching out to? So in response, he wrote her back. He asked her this, what church she'd been attending? only to discover that the church that she had joined was the church he was pastoring. His church. Oh my, what an eye-opening experience. So I want us to hit pause just for a second. And I want us to ask ourselves what we might have said or might we have done to call someone like this young woman to hit the eject button on church. Now, let's look at it this way. Virginia, Virginia has traditionally been a Republican state, but today it kind of goes back and forth, it seems, depending on elections. We know that our area leans largely Democratic. We have members here at Altersgate who are Democrats, and we have members here who are Republicans. In fact, the senator from Kansas who was here and a member of this church along with Frankie uh, has been coming here for years, for 40 years until he just retired. 
I can remember when I helped with the lineup of the 4th of July parade several years back in my previous church in Culpeper. I discovered we had members of our church as I was helping to get that lineup done. I walked up to the Democratic float and guess who was there? Half the float were members of Culpeper United Methodist Church. I walked on down the parade route a little bit and I looked up and there's the next float, the Republican float. And guess who's on the float? Half the people on the float are from Culpeper United Methodist Church and there's my congregation. It may not be so different here really. Maybe the new perception to create could be one where Christians are characterized by respecting each other, thinking biblically, and finding solutions to complex issues and learning to live and serve together. I think it would do us well to realize neither party actually has a corner on the truth. And it's actually a danger when a church gets married to either party. What does scripture say about who we should be married to as the church? The Republicans, the Democrats, someplace in between, who should we be married to is the church. Jesus Christ. We are called the bride of Christ. So here's a question. Which party do you think Jesus sides with? Just a good question. Maybe neither. Maybe both. Scripture says we should all pray for our leaders. That's not going to say we always agree, but neither does it say to slander, to lie about, to put down, to use mean-spirited rhetoric, or show disrespect. We as Christians actually have a moral and ethical responsibility as well as a spiritual responsibility not to slander, not to send out inflammatory emails or Facebook posts about opposing parties and candidates. Now, here's something we could do. And it's very simple. And I don't know why I didn't do it sooner. I thought about it, but I hadn't done it until this week. Do you know that everybody who is part of the Altersgate family here or wherever you are could actually put on your signature page on your email, if you use that, our mission statement. In fact, anybody that gets emails from me, you'll notice that that's there now as of this week can't tell you why but I can't ask somebody to do something you're not willing to do yourself right so there it is altars gate courageously living God's unconditional love that's who we are as a church family that's who we are together that's a value that unites us Paul shares with us how we are to act let no evil talk come out of your mouths but only what is useful for building up as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. Scott Soule, who is a Presbyterian pastor, in his book, Jesus Outside the Lines, A Way Forward for Those Tired of Taking Sides, says Christians should be the most affirming people in the world. Rather than rushing to find fault, we should proactively seek opportunities to catch others doing good and to encourage, put courage into others. When we speak of others in unloving and unkind ways, do you know we actually grieve the Holy Spirit, which means to inflict distress or great sadness upon I'm just not sure why when it comes to politics, some Christians take off their Christian hat and put on something contrary to their faith. And the key is young adults and others see this, and so they figure out, again, that our walk and our talk isn't matching up. So Jesus must deal with this head on. As a group of religious leaders try in their sly way to trap him so that either way he answers, they trap him. The Herodians were Jews, but even by the question, you can tell politics was way more important to them than faith. They asked Jesus about paying taxes, right? Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to the emperor, to Caesar? Jesus asked to see a coin. Jesus then asked whose image, whose picture is on the coin. The emperor, Caesar's, they responded. So here's what Jesus says. You probably know this very well. 
Give to Caesar that which is Caesar's and give to God that which is God's. Now, don't miss the heart of Jesus' question before he gives a response. Most often what we remember in this story is this, render unto the emperor, render unto Caesar. But the question that Jesus asked before that is just as important. Whose image is on the coin? Do you know the same word is found in Genesis 1:27? image? The Greek word is ikona. Ikona. So God created them in his ikona, his image. So let me ask, was Jesus in turn trying to be wise and tricky, sly with the Herodians? Well, I think the response was definitely wise. Jesus was saying there are things in Caesar's or government's realm like money, politics, elections, and we are to give those to the government. That is our duty as citizens of this country. It's our privilege, actually, as citizens of this country. But just as Caesar's image is on the coin, guess whose image is to be on our hearts? The image of God. Give to Caesar that which is Caesar's. Give to God that which is God's. And all of a sudden, this verse takes on a whole new meaning for us, doesn't it? Let's be sure not to confuse our allegiance to a political party or to the state with our faith in God. I'm almost sure there's plenty on both parties that Jesus could take issues with. But there's also many things in both parties Jesus would be glad to be part of. Let's not allow a party or a leader or even our nation to become an idol. Even though I believe we should love our country, and I do, and I hope you do too, we must give God our allegiance, our souls, and our hearts. So that when we get involved in the civic arena, our hearts actually still belong to God, whose image we bear. We'll all only be on this earth a short period of time, but we will be in God's kingdom forever. Scripture says if we belong to God, we're actually already citizens of God's kingdom. So, whether you are involved in science, politics, medicine, sports, whatever, as followers of Jesus, we should seek to be a blessing to others and live out our faith loving even those we might disagree with from time to time. We get it right when we work for justice with truth, grace, and love and keep open minds and hearts and a perspective that we all still have something to learn, just like Brian shared last week about how to learn to deal with people of different ethnicities. It was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who said, many of you know this, Darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. You know, friends, I often encourage folks and young folks to get involved in politics and science. It's a good thing. Be involved in the important issues of our time. And again, to stay open-minded. When we are closed-minded, we refuse to listen to others' ideas, and we treat those with opposing ideas with contempt. And when we do, we don't model a Christ-like attitude. Let's learn this from James 1.19. Let's be quick to listen. Let's be slow to speak. And let's be slow to anger. Let's remain teachable, humble, and realize we all have things yet to learn and yet to do. Amen. Let us pray. Oh God, we want to thank you for the opportunity to think about our faith and use our minds in relation to important topics like science and politics and how these can actually live together. Help us to be intellectually active using the tools John Wesley encouraged us to use, scripture and reason and tradition and experience. Help us not fear science and help us not misuse politics and forgive us, Lord, when we have. 
as Christians and as your church, help us reflect your love and grace in all of our conversations, in all of our actions. And may it be your icona, your image that grows more and more in our hearts each day. Help us care for your creation. Help us pray for our political leaders and our nation and other nations. Help us see all people as you do, each a child of God, a person of worth. Teach us your ways so we can live in your will.